BLC Jamaica for all your services in alarms, CCTV, and gate automation. Call us today at 1 866 351 1105 or 876 320 7711. Check us out for all your security services. Again, call us at 1 866 351 1105 or 876. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Open Gate Show special. Of course, each week we'll have special shows highlighting various aspects of horse racing. Today we have Chris Forbes, an American who indulges in female jockeys only. And he has interviewed almost all of them he has been with them dining and whatever way to correspond and he's going to give us a brief understanding of how he does that chris forbes welcome to the open gate show Just give me a little background on me i live over in new jersey in the united states of america uh my father owned horses for a while so he got me a job at a racetrack called garden state park which was burned down in a fire in 1977. And this guy, Robert Brennan, ended up rebuilding the racetrack over in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which was about 10 minutes from me, and ended up working there. Well, Robert Brennan, when he opened the racetrack up, spent a lot of money on the racetrack. And then, unfortunately, this is when casinos weren't even around, except over in Las Vegas, Nevada, which I'm sure you heard of. Well, Atlantic City, New Jersey, ended up opening about nine or ten casinos down there, including one, Trump Plaza, which was owned by the, not president, uh, but Donald Trump owned it, who obviously later became the president of the United States. Well, it ended up really crippling the racetrack because uh, a lot of people stopped going to the racetrack and they started going down to the casino because, you know, you had the slot machines, you had these big hotels down there. And plus you had a big shoreline down there and you could stay overnight in a hotel and anything like that. So to, to make a long story short, the racetrack closed in 2001 and I was still working there. About the, I was working in security there. But the last two or three years that I was working there, I started, you know, I started getting a little, not friendly friendly, but I got to start to know a lot of the female jockeys that rode there. Well, after the track closed, I still wanted to stay involved in horse racing. And this is, of course, way before Facebook. This is just when the internet had started. You only had, like, there was no Google back then. You had, like, Yahoo and AOL were the only two, you know, uh, email companies. You didn't have Gmail and MSNBC and all that stuff. Cable had just started out. There was no ES ESPN had just started out and all that, you know. And I kind of just wanted to start you know, I started up, I had a music website on the side, so I wanted to, I noticed, I went on the internet, and I was Googling on Yahoo and AOL, and I noticed there was, like, nothing about female jockeys, except, like, Julie Crone, who was the most famous jockey, and uh, at the time, you know, she was the only one to ride the Triple Crown race at the time. So, I kept, you know, I kept in touch with some of the local jockeys, and I just thought, oh, I'll just start up a little website and I'll interview some of these local jocks. And it just grew from there. I mean, Delaware Park is 45 minutes from my house. So anytime some girl riders would go down there, I would drive down, I'd meet up with them. I introduced myself and most of them would give me their phone numbers. None of them were like, who the hell is this nut or whatever. And then I had Mammoth Park, which is, you know, the home of the Haskell. That was like an hour up on the Jersey Shore. I could go there. It was a track Philadelphia Park, which I currently work at, which I didn't work at at the time. That was right over the bridge for me, like 20 minutes. So anytime a girl jockey would go over there to ride, I would drive over. I was working in a hospital, but I was working at night. All these tracks are through the day. So I would go over there and I started just getting interviews with jockeys and all that. And then I am getting a job at parks about three months after Garden State Park closed. And they had a lot of female jockeys there. And, of course, any time jockeys would come in to ride and all that, I would be able to, because I work in the back, 
I'd be able to have contact with them. And, you know, the website just started to grow more and more. And of course, with Facebook, you know, that's been like a godsend. I mean, there's hundreds of female jockeys on there. You know, anytime some girl rides at a racetrack, I can just go on Facebook, type her name in. We usually have a bunch of mutual friends. I'll send her off a friend request and more times than not, you know, I'm able to do interviews with them. So it's just very easy to get interviews now with them. And the site's just grown and grown over the years. I have about 200 interviews on there. I have over about 12,000 pictures on my uh, uh, Yahoo page. I have, it's called Flickr, but it's part of Yahoo. I have about 12,000 pictures on there. And it's just, it's just, it's very cool. Every time, you know, some young girl, you know, comes along, I, I try to reach out to them. I interview them. I also interview retired writers. You know, some of the ladies that rode back in the 70s when it was a lot tougher on female jockeys back then. So the site is based on, it's just interviews, but it's from retired riders all the way up to current riders. And I've been doing it since about 2003. Okay. Uh Name the current the current top female riders you're associated with. Uh there is there's a few. There's not Anna Naprovnik was at the time she rode, she ended up uh getting married and you know retiring. She's a trainer now, she had some kids and all that. Uh she was groomed or not groomed, but she was she was that good of a rider that people were saying she was gonna be the next Julie Crone and all that. And she was for a while, for a few years, Anna was the top female rider in the country. Like she would ride in big stake races too. So, you know, uh, there's a girl I just interviewed. I haven't put the interview up. Uh, this girl, Farron Peterson, I believe her name is. She just was the second lead rider up at Monmouth Park. And Monmouth Park is not the easiest place to ride. Uh, for riders, you know, the purses there are very, very good. And, you know, she, uh, she was, she's also a veterinarian. So she started off riding in California and she actually got Julie Crone to be her agent last summer. And they rode up at Monmouth Park and now she's riding down at Laurel. So, you know, I, I got, to, I mean, I'm friends with her on Facebook, but I kind of waited until after Monmouth Park was over to interview her. Uh, you know, um, Carol Sedanio is another, uh, I would say, top rider right now. She just passed winning a thousand races, and there's only, I think, thirteen or fourteen female riders that have over a thousand wins. And she's been the leading rider at Delaware Park like the last four or five years. So I would put her up in like the top three right now for riders. You know, so there's not a lot of. I mean, the girl jockeys have come a long way since I would say the seventies. I mean. I, when I've been doing interviews with some of these, you know, girl riders, I'm not sure of the name, but some woman had told me when she was down riding at Charlestown, uh, West Virginia, uh, when she was coming out of the uh, jocks room to go out, you know, out in the paddock to ride, one of the male riders threatened to put her over the rail. So, <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta be pretty tough, you know, to be a girl rider. You know, it's not just putting up with the trainers. Because, you know, even some trainers nowadays, it, it was a lot worse back then. You know, they had the mentality that a girl wasn't as strong as a male and they wouldn't put a girl rider on some of their better horses. They may let them work out horses in the morning, but when it came time to ride in the afternoon, they would go put some male jockey on there. So, so women have come a long way. I'm sure there's still some male trainers that just won't ride female riders for whatever reason. But, you know, they definitely come a long way. I would definitely say that from, you know, just from reading my interviews back in the seventies and eighties with a lot of these retired riders, they just overcome a lot. And, you know, listen, you gotta be tough to be a, a female in a, a sport of horse racing. There's no question. You gotta have a set of, you know, what's to be a, oh, you know, it's, it's a dangerous sport too. Obviously. Oh yeah. I had an interview once with a, a jockey, a female jockey by the name of Karen Rogers. Are you, are you, uh, do you know her? Yes, I interviewed her maybe about less than a year ago. Uh, 
you know, uh, there's a female jockeys group on Facebook uh, r- uh, run by this woman named Sandy Coster. She's also a retired rider. Um, a lot of she's got me a lot of interviews with some of the retired riders. Some of them kind of balk at first when I say I'd like to interview you, and they're they're like, "But I've rode in fifteen or twenty years." I'm like, "I don't care." I'm like. The website's not just about riding, you know, doing interviews with girls that are riding in 2020 or 21. I said, I'd like to hear your story. And I'm sure other people may want to want to do it. And Sandy's like been very supportive. She loves my website. And she hooked me up with Karen. And Karen at the time, of course, just had her book come out. So yes. that made for a great read because I, I helped her. You know, of course, I did some questions about the book and all that. And I don't know if you've read the book. But yes, I did. Oh, uh, you know, she went through a real tough time, and, oh, she sure. wrote, and she wrote at the old Garden State Park, not the one I worked at, the one that burned down. You know, so she rode there, and you know, yeah, she had a real. But I don't want to get into all the details of the book. But yeah, she went through a lot of personal problems with uh, her husband. You know, slash, you know, boy, I guess it was a husband slash trainer who did a lot of, you know, put her through hell and all that through a lot of this stuff. And it's a, I couldn't put the book down. She sent it to me and it took me less than a week to read it. I mean, reading some of the stuff in the book, I was like, I mean, look, I, I've worked in the back of a racetrack at racetracks for over 20 years. I mean, I could sit here and tell you a lot of stories. I, I don't want to do that now. Maybe after I leave Parks Racing, arm at there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the back that the public does not know about. And she really opened up to a lot of stuff that's, you know, it, it must have taken her a lot of courage to put that down and be able to put it in like a book form for people to read, you know. And apparently it went like number one on Amazon and all that. And so, you know... And she was a very good rider at the time. Oh, yes. you know, she was, uh, you know, if you go on Equibase and look her stats up, she wasn't some jockey that, you know, just won a couple races a year. You know, she was, you know, leading rider in a lot of places, you know, down Atlantic City and all that. And she was she, a leading rider. Yeah, she rode against Cordero and those guys. So you know, it takes a lot to ride against those. We had a, a lot of exclusive interview. Uh, Karen and I, and it lasted, well, I had to do part two, and it, 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 she revealed a lot, and, you know, it, it really, she surely is a very courageous female to be revealing such vivid um, issues that affected her upbringing. But, uh, Chris, at Philadelphia Parks, there was a female writer there, her name, uh, I, don't, I'm, I can't recall her name. This is the rad, current writing, doing very well. What's her name? I don't know. Is it Pfeiffer? Or it's a, no, it's not Park. It's it's uh, Santa Nita. Well, we don't have we don't have any female writers at Parks right now, but we've we've used to. I mean, I ended up I was working with a girl named Maria Remedio for a while. I was helping her out, like, doing social media and stuff. I got her and a couple other uh, girl jocks to go out to Hoosier Park, and they did a female jockey challenge there. And, I mean, well, see, what happened is now, with all this COVID crap going on, Yeah. Uh, see, this is why I didn't get to meet Farron Peterson. When she was up at Monmouth Park riding, oh, if, if there hadn't been no COVID stuff or anything, I would have absolutely met her because, I, I mean, a lot of trainers from Monmouth Park, because they, they Monmouth Park runs on the weekend and we run during the week. There's no question uh, a trainer would have shipped the horse down to, to, to Parks Racing and she would have came in the ride and I would have been able to meet her. But what happened is now no out-of-town riders can come ride at Parks right now. So, And I think that's going on like at almost every racetrack because they don't want they don't want, you know, COVID getting in the jock room. You know, God forbid that happens. We'll have to shut down, you know. Yeah. So, you know, and we actually did shut down for three months because because Parks is over in Pennsylvania and the governor shut down all the casinos. So I didn't work from last March until June uh, last year. You know, a lot of the trainees were worried if the, the track was even going to ever reopen again, you know. So... 
you know, and I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you nothing that's not, you can go on the Pollock Report and read this, but at one point about a month and a half ago, we had 12 effing jockeys test positive for freaking COVID. Ooh, and they couldn't, they couldn't ride for two weeks. And the only reason, the only way they'd be able to come back to ride, they had to provide a negative Coggins test. Otherwise, they weren't able to ride. So, I mean, I'm not telling you nothing. Like, that's right in the, I mean, that went on the Pollock Report. It was right in there when, when under the word racing news, you know, 12 jockeys test positive at Parks Racing. So, and it wasn't a secret. I mean, when you see 12 jockeys not riding for a couple of weeks at a racetrack, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why. But <laughs> no, Carol was, when, 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 uh, if she was allowed to ride, if she'd been at, uh, parks a long time her boyfriend's Juan Vasquez who, ha- who has a whole barn full of horses right now but most of her business is down at De- most of her business was down in Delaware Park like I said she was a leading rider down there for like five years well if she was to come up and and ride at parks for one day she'd have to quarantine and wouldn't be able to ride at Delaware Park for two weeks well she's not doing that so you know that's, you know, right now, like I said, she's down at Laura right now, and she's doing pretty good. I mean, there's only, thir- like I said, there's only 13 jockeys that have 1,000 wins, you know. And Maria, she hurt her shoulder a couple of years ago, and it was just, you know, I lift weights and all. When you use your shoulder, especially if you're a jockey and you're driving down the – when you screw your shoulder up, that's, you know, you're – and she got a couple of operations on her shoulder, and apparently the uh, – Whoever operated on her shoulder, it just wasn't going away. So finally, she decided to retire. But she had about 550 wins when she retired about two and a half years ago. But I have no doubt if she would have kept riding, she would have ended up getting over a thousand wins because she was winning three or four races a week. So, uh, Chris, what's your opinion on female riders more prone to fear of injury, falling off a horse in a race than the male riders? Uh, I would say they're a little more prone because obviously the female riders aren't necessarily riding the, the, you know, the favorites or the best horses in a race. And look, it's just unfortunate that when you're riding horses that are not, you know, four to five, two to one, even money, you know, yeah, there's a chance that you're riding. I don't want to say it's a donkey horse, but unfortunately, if you're riding a horse that could be 15 to 1, 20 to 1, especially when you're starting out, you can't, you know, if you're starting out and you're an apprentice, you don't want to turn mounts down because that's just going to look bad in any trainer's eyes that whether it's a male or a female, you know, if, even if you're a male jockey and you start turning mounts down because oh, I don't want to ride that horse because, you know, it's going to be 20 to 1. Huh. That saying that sends a bad message to every trainer back there that you're not willing to work hard and to do what you got to do. So, but obviously, you know, males obviously are stronger than females. So, yeah, you know, like I said, they don't ride the best horses in the races. And, you know, Maria had a bunch of injuries over the years, but this was the one that just unfortunately you know, sent her to the retirement home. Not literally, but I mean, she just, she rode five races in 2018 and her uh, shoulder wasn't getting any better. And, you know, she, she had a couple of kids and all that. So she made the decision to just, she still gallops horses in the morning. Her husband rides, uh, Abner Adamo, he rides at parks. He's doing very well and all that. I'm sure Maria, Knowing the competitor she is, she would love to come back and ride against him. Because, you know, (laughs) but with her shoulder being the way it is, I would even advise her, don't even take a chance, even for one race, because God forbid you fall or something. I mean, I just interviewed Sydney Underwood, and she was riding down Atlantic City one night. She had rode down at Monmouth Park, Atlantic City. Listen to this story. She was riding two tracks in one day. She rode Monmouth Park during the day, hopped in her car, and drove down to Atlantic City Race Course to ride a race at night. She was riding in the second race. She took a tumble. The horse stepped on her. She ended up getting paralyzed from the waist down. Wow. And she said 
the freaking ambulance wouldn't take her to the Atlantic City Hospital. She had a freaking the ambulance had to take her all the way to Philadelphia. And, she, you know, she was in a wheelchair. You know, she was she wrote she wrote a lot of races. She ended up becoming a trainer for a while after that. And, you know, that's a sad story. I'm, I'm listening to her. You know, I've talked to her on the phone a few times. The interview was done. Most of my interviews are done through Messenger because the phone is just impossible. I used to do the interviews by phone, <laughs> like a little ta- my dad's little tape recorder. But having to sit there and rewind and then, oh, what a pain in the butt that is because I don't want to misquote somebody so most all my interviews now are just done on messenger it's a lot easier but god just reading that interview and having to transcribe it i mean i can't imagine myself being in a wheelchair you know and she doesn't regret it she said she told me she said chris i don't regret riding even though i'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life she says i loved being a jockey and i don't looking back i don't regret not being a jockey even though this is the end result you know it's amazing how brave these female riders are. You know, for example, uh, it's a man's world, you know. Well, anything physical, it's, it, it, regards them, it, it is regarded as being in a man's world. But these jockeys uh, that have evolved into being top female riders, you say they're currently either about to train horses or they may run a farm or they're still sticking with horses. What has become of Julie Cohn presently? She was an age, she was an agent to that jockey you mentioned there. Uh, she was. What is uh, what is Julie Crone currently doing? Do you know? Julie, from what I understand, after the Mammoth Park meet, Farron went up to New York for a little while. I guess the business wasn't very good up there. And Julie, I don't know the whole story. I didn't want to get into it with Farron in case, like, her and Julie got into a fight or whatever. I wouldn't even pu- put something like that on my website. That's not what it's about. I don't want to sit there and say, I didn't even ask her, you know. But New York, to me... I wouldn't have went up. If, I mean, if if I would have been Ferrin's, ma- not that many jockeys have man- managers or whatever, but I would have even told her not to go up to New York. There's no New York because New York now has like getting money from slot revenue. The purses up there are insane right now, and you have all the better. Like I said, with these smaller tracks being closed, New York has their purses are like. Now I know you guys are over in Jamaica, but I mean, if you ain't know anything about the U.S. dollar, the the average purse in New York is like fifty or sixty thousand dollars. That's yeah. a lot of money, and you got a lot of top riders, you know, that go up there and ride. A lot of the jocks at Mammoth don't like riding in the cold, so they go down to Florida and ride at Gulfstream. Yes. That's a really nice racetrack too. I mean, Farron mm-hmm. had nothing to be ashamed of. Being the second leading rider, and this is when she was an apprentice, so she had that weight allowance. But to me, being the second leading rider at Monmouth in your first year of being a jockey, that's nothing to sneeze at, you know. And she's better off going down to Laurel where the purses aren't as, you know, the money isn't as big money-wise, but the jockey colony, that's that's what they call it, a jockey colony, isn't as strong. So you don't have as many, you know, bigger name jockeys that have been already established up there. Cause let me tell you, when you're a, when you're a jockey, you know, obviously if some jockeys have been riding up in New York or any other racetrack for a couple of years and somebody new comes into the jocks room, yeah, hey, listen, they're all competing for money. You know, they don't, you know, they're not going to just sit there, you know, not that they're going to harass a jockey and all that, but they're going to sit there and say to themselves, you know, I don't want this girl or even this guy winning a bunch of races. That's taking money off their food, you know. So it's very competitive being a jockey, you know. Just like playing football or anything else, you know, any of these other sports, you know. We got a Super Bowl coming here in a week and a half. And you got freaking Tom Brady, you know, 43 years old quarterback, which is amazing. He's in this 10th Super Bowl. I mean, it's hard enough just to get there to one. 
friggin' 10? I mean, I'll tell you what the what the one of the most greatest things I've ever seen myself at parks was this girl Sophie Doyle came in to ride. She's from out of town. I think she rode in the Midwest. Some guy shipped the horse in uh, in 2019 to run on. We have a PA Derby, which is uh, on national TV on NBC here. I'm sure the video is up on YouTube. But our old racing director, Sal Sinatra, combined the PA Derby, which is a grade one race, is worth a million dollars now. And he put the cotillion, which is uh, fillies, female horses. <clears throat> He combined both those races and the cotillion now also got bumped up to a million dollars. And that was also a grade one. So we were on NBC for an hour that, that, you know, those years we ran it. Mm -hmm. So here we are on national TV, you know, Jerry Bailey's doing, you know, he's one of the announcers and all that. You got all these cameras around. So Sophie Doyle comes in the ride. <clears throat> Before she's on is about 12 to one. I met her in the back when she was getting her license and all that. So after my office closes, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I go up front and the race goes off about six o'clock. The Via Derby was after that race. So I thought, oh, maybe she's got a shot. It'd be just nice to see. I've never seen a girl ride a million dollar race. Here she comes running down. You know, the horse goes off. The race comes off. Here she goes off. She starts going out, taking a horse out to the outside around a three quarter pole. I'm watching the I'm right by the winter circle. You know, because I'm in security, I'm able to go there. I'm not in the crowd. I'm right by there. I'm watching the race. We have a big screen TV behind our turf course. And I'm watching. I'm like, oh, my God, is she going to win this frigging race? She takes huh. the horse like four wide and wins going by like five lengths. I almost cried. And I'm in a suit and a tie. I literally almost cried watching that horse come back to the winner's circle because here I am. I'm literally feet from her watching a girl win a million dollar grade one race on national TV. You know, they're putting the flowers up on her, on the horse and all that. She's getting her picture taken. You know, she's getting interviewed by NBC after the race and all that. You know, so, you know, I had a friend who was a cameraman, you know, Dan Healy. He was taking a bunch of pictures of her walking. All, I, I walked her back. I made it look good. I walked her back. <laughs> My boss didn't say anything. Here I am walking back. I'm like, oh, my God, Sophie, I was almost in tears watching you win that race. And my signature is I get a lot of the jockeys doing thumbs up in their pictures. Now, I couldn't get the picture with her because I'm at work and I'm wearing a suit and a tie. Where am I going to post it somewhere? My boss would have a heart attack. <laughs> but I got her. I got Dan to give her me a thumbs up. But that was one of the most proudest moments I've ever had being at the track was watching because – Girls don't win million dollar grade one races. And that like set her business off a of fire. Like I think she's flown over, like that horse went overseas to ride and all that. So that really drummed up her business. Like I'm not exactly sure where she's riding at now, but that her and Carol, I would say, are probably, and Farron are probably the top two or three riders right now in America, I would say. Okay. I mean, you win a great, and I'm sure, I know, I'm a competitor. I would not want to lose to a girl. <laughs> I'm sure every guy in that race was raving to themselves that they lost to a girl. Because, <laughs> oh, that jocks room, you know, the female jocks room and the male is, yeah, but I'm sure underneath their breath, they might even got busted on. You lost to a freaking girl? Oh, because, I mean, all the jockeys in that race are all, shipping in they're not our local jockeys they're jockeys that are you know coming in for the day to ride because all those horses in that race they're not any parts jockeys they're i mean bob baffett flew one of his horses in to ride in the pa derby uh the year before i met him his, his horse won and all that so all the jockeys that come in to ride that day you know like mike smith and all that hell yeah they can get busted on <laughs> even when they come back to I'm sure even when they went back to ride at their track, which was probably like San Anita or Gulfstream, I could see some of the guys, jockeys busting them. You lost to a girl, <laughs> you know, and then they're cursing at him and, you know, playfully busting on him and all that. But I'm sure the guy jocks hate losing to a girl jock. But what a race she rode that day, man. Like I said, I was almost in tears.
I had to, I tried to tell myself not to tear up because I didn't want to be on TV crying. <laughs> well, well, Chris, so much, so little time. But before I, before we go, what advice would you give to a young female jockey? Of course, uh, in Jamaica, we we see the races in parks, Santa Anita, Aqueduct, Saratoga, Gulfstream, they're about. And we have, you know, there are a lot of female jockeys that we see riding and we have a few here, but what could you let on to inspire a, a female who wants to be a jockey? I, I, I never answered this question before. Actually, I, I always do that. I always ask, one of the questions I always ask every female rider is if a young girl ever came up to you, what advice would you give? And of course, every answer is different. The one thing I would say if some, I actually had Maria and Tara Hemmings at the time, some woman had contacted me and she was running like a horse camp and I had them go out there and do like a half hour chat with these young girls and all that. But the one advice I would say is, you can't sit there and say, oh, I don't live near a horse farm or I can't do this. I can't do that. All right. Well, you might have to stay home with mom and dad until you find a horse farm, because obviously you got to learn how to gallop. You got to have a love for horses. That's the number one thing. And you got to want it more than anything else. Like some girls have said to me, as soon as they saw the horse race when they were eight years old, they knew that's what they wanted to do. Like, you know, especially if there was a female in the race. Other ones have said, oh, you know, I wanted to do this when I was growing up. And then, you know, I ended up getting a job on a horse farm and then I kind of grew into it. But that's you don't have to like like horses at eight years old. But if you're near a racetrack, most racetracks will let you start to work on there when you're 16. As long as you have your parents OK, they sign off on it. And then when you're 18, you can go, you know, you don't need your parents and all that. Most people, I would say, even males, but jock girls, you would go off in the barns and start walking horses. You know, you want to get a feel of what horses look like. They can bite you. They're dangerous, obviously. They can throw you off the horse. You want to be able to get accustomed to be around a horse. So get a job as a hot walker in the morning. It's only a couple of hours a day. And if, you know, so even eventually you can start walking the horses to the, into the paddock and you can get in a winter circle, you know. Then eventually you start telling your boss, which is the trainer and all that, maybe six months in, that you'd like to start exercising horses and all that. You know, if he takes a liking to you, then he'll start putting you up on horses. You know, at that point, maybe you want to tell your boss, which is a trainer, of course, that you'd like to start becoming a jockey and all that. If, if, if you end up looking natural up on a horse and all that, and you start getting taught how to ride and all that, well, then that's that'll be that'd be the next step. You know, this what the, most racetracks let let a girl or a guy you're riding two races and then the stewards decide whether you're good enough and then they hand you a license. If they don't, they're not going to let you ride in a race because obviously they don't want to have eight people get killed in the race you're in. You know, but I would tell her you got to go in and you got to want it 110. percent You can't go in there, and if you're not near a racetrack. Go find a horse farm. They're everywhere. You know, do you have to drive an hour each way? If you want it that much, you go do it. You know, and if you're not, then fine. You're going to have to, you just, you'll wait till you move out to your parents' house and then you go find a horse farm or a racetrack, you know, and get a job there. You know, when you're up front and you see trainers up there, you go up to them and approach them and say, I'm so and so, you know. How old are you? You know, I'm 17 years old. You know, I'd like to, you know, how would I be able to get a job in a backstretch? There's always, there's like 140 trainers at parks. There's always jobs available. And, you know, someone could leave you a pass. Now, of course, yeah, it's an early morning job. So if you're not an early riser, guess what? See ya. You know, I'd be park starts training at seven o'clock in the morning. I don't, other tracks are different, but Sometimes that means sometimes you'd have to get there like at six, five thirty five in the morning. So, you know, depending on how far you leave, you know, you, you, you know, away from the track, you might have to get up early. You know, there's a girl I know named Donna. She gets to the track at four thirty in the morning. 
So, you know, it's just, it's got to be a labor of love. It's just got to be something. And the funny, <laughs> the funny thing is, I think some people just have no idea. Like, I see owners when they get licensed, you know, they get licensed and they're an owner and all that. I think some of these owners just think, oh, they, they see owners getting in the winner's circle on Kentucky Derby Day, and they think it's all that easy. Well, you got to pay for the horses to eat. You got to pay the trainer because he's got to pay the help. You know, you got to pay the exercise rider, you know, so it's not that easy, you know. And being a jockey, whether you're a male or female, it's not easy. You, but you just got to want it 110%. And you got to go in there and you just got to. It's not, you don't have to know exactly everything about it, but you got to ask a lot. When you get a, if you get a job on a racetrack, ask a lot of questions. You know, most jockeys, whether even they're, I, if there's a female jockey at the racetrack, obviously I would go to her and just, you know, ask for her advice and all that. Cause some male jockeys might blow you off and just not, you know, have the time or whatever. But that's what I would tell the girl, you know, you know, if, 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 if there's no racetrack near you, go to a horse farm, you know, and learn to be around horses, get accustomed to them, get it to a point where you're not even afraid because if a horse bites you, it's not going to tickle or kick. <laughs> you know, I've seen people get kicked, you know, and the horse doesn't kick you with its front legs. It kicks you with the rear and it could send you flying. If it kicks you in the stomach, ouch, or the leg, ouch. So, you know, <laughs> but that's what I would tell her, you know. Go in, ask a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions because that's how you learn. I mean, you know, football players or soccer players or tennis players or, you know, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, you know, Hank Aaron. Or, I mean, I'm just rolling off some names you probably know. <laughs> Hank Aaron, you know, who just unfortunately passed away. He didn't just learn how to hit 753 home runs, you know. Soccer players just don't walk out on the soccer field and know how to play soccer. Or, you know, Serena Williams knows how to play tennis. Probably took them hours upon hours of of training and just being able to know how to play tennis and all that. So horse racing is the same thing, you know. And it's got to be a labor of love. You can't just go in there, oh, I hate this. Oh, I'm sick of getting up at four in the morning. This isn't me. Well, then quit. You know, because, you know, and it's something you're, it's not going to take a month. It's going to take you. Usually it takes a year or a year and a half before you'll be able to get your license and be able to, you know, start riding races. So it's not easy. It's for the chosen few, you oh, know, yeah. and don't and don't listen to naysayers that say you can't get it done. You know, just you, you let that go in one ear and not the other. Oh, sure. You know, you know. And you can't be afraid. That's one of the, you cannot be afraid of injury because it's probably going to happen. You know, it's just, it's inevitable. It happens to everyone. You know, it's a rough sport, you know, hockey. I don't know if you've seen that, you know, guys skating around 30 miles an hour, slamming into the board. Oh, yes. It's inevitable. You know, it's, you know, even tennis, which, you know, you wouldn't think, you could pull a muscle. You're running up to the frigging net, trying to hit a ball over. I mean, you're running back and forth. You know, you could pull a muscle, you know, it happens. So, but yeah, you're riding a 1200 pound animal blowing out of the gate, going 30 miles an hour. If God forbid, unfortunately, that horse snaps its leg, which I hate saying it, but it's, it does happen like Sidney Underwood. Yeah. You could be paralyzed. You can't worry about that. You can't be, it's not everything. You can't be scared when you're riding in a race. Oh, such a dangerous career. It is. I mean, it could be very rewarding. I mean, you know, going in the winter circle, I can imagine. I mean, I've obviously I've never rode. I'm 250 pounds, six foot, but I can just imagine. I mean, like Sophie Doyle that day. I mean, all I mean, just everything she's worked for, and then you know, something like that happens. It's like that's amazing for her, you know. And I'm sure she worked very hard for everything she got, you know. It's just, it's you know, something like that happens to her, and then you got somebody like Sydney Underwood. And there's another girl, Ann Von Rosen, who was riding out at some turf paradise in Arizona. You know, she got paralyzed in the race. You know, unfortunately, turf paradise doesn't have the best horses. That's one of them smaller racetracks. And, you know, she's still right now. I interviewed her a few years ago. I see pictures of her on Facebook. She's trying to learn to walk again, which is great, you know, because obviously, you know, things have obviously are things a lot better in 2021 when someone's paralyzed. You know, but 
that's another thing, you know, and you can't just sit there and say, oh, well, I'm only going to ride New York or I'm only going to ride Florida or California. If you're a female, chances are that ain't going to happen. You know, you're, you're going to have to just, you got to pick and choose, you know, and Theron's the perfect example. She was there about a month. I buy the New York Post every day and I saw she was getting mounts on 20 to one shots, hardly riding a race a day and all that. I think she said, I'm out of here. She was gone within a month. That was a smart move on her part because she was wasting her time up there. I would tell her right to your face. You were wasting. New York is too hard. You know, you're a great rider and all that, but New York's just, it's a, that's a stay away from New York. You know, Laurel's much better for you. There's other, plus there's other, there's like four female jockeys down there. So female jockeys are more accepted down there. You got, uh, Forest Boyce is down there. Carol's riding down there. And you're down there. So, you know, obviously the Laurel trainers are more receptive than female riders and they're going to be up in New York where they're going to ride males. That's just, it's a known fact. Oh, there won't be a, there will not be a female rider up at Saratoga this year unless somebody ships in and they like, like Sophie Doyle ends up riding the horse or something like that. That's just, that's just what will happen probably. You know, unfortunately, yeah. you know, well, females, they have to work much harder. They have more. Yes. Issues than oh, absolutely. Oh, there, there's no question about that. You you can. I mean, uh, any interview jo uh, jockey I've ever interviewed, I've always asked him, do you feel you had to work harder than your male counterparts? And I, all of them say that. I mean, how would you feel your first race coming out of Charlestown and some guy threatens to put you over the rail? You know, mm. you got to say to yourself, I'm not going to curse. You got to say to yourself, F that guy. You know, I'm not listening <laughs> to him. Imagine her running back in the jock room and saying, oh, my God, I'm not doing this. And throwing her riding uh, crap in the uh, going in the jock room and throwing her helmet down and quitting. She said, she told me, screw that guy. I'm not listening to him. She went on the road. Oh. And hey. jock is well, especially the females. You know, it's, it's really unique. And boy. So much stress. But Chris, we have to go now, and it is a pleasure having you on the Open Day. Oh, anytime, man. I'll, I'll see if I can find uh, – I'll try to contact maybe a female writer or two and maybe have them on. I'll let them know. I was in interview for the show. It was great and all that. You know, I'll oh, see if I can find – I mean, you know, maybe I'll reach out to Sydney Underwood. I mean, I mean her story – I mean. You know, that's the woman that's in the wheelchair, but she could probably tell you a lot of stories because, you know, she rode back in the 80s when it was a lot harder. <laughs> so I'm sure she could probably. And let me tell you something. She won't mince words when she's on the phone with you or on video. And obviously she doesn't have to curse, but she will not hold back. That's one thing. When I've been talking to her, when I was doing an interview, oh, she'll probably have some stories to tell you. That's for sure. <laughs> I really appreciate it, Chris. Really. Oh. No problem, bud. So as soon as you get that up, you know, you could send me a message and we, we'll work on that. All right, I will. I'll reach out to her over the weekend. All right. Thank you, Chris. All right, talk to you later. All right. Okay, man. Bye-bye. Bye. That was Chris Forbes, a gentleman who specializes with being acquainted with the female riders in the United States. And he has interviewed majority of them and the open gate show intends to interview a few of those riders currently and those who are sidelined with injuries take care this is another open gate show special blc jamaica for all your services in alarms cctv and gate automation call us today at 1-876-351-1105 or 876 320-7711. Check us out for all your security services. Again, call us at 1-876-351-1105 or 